Okay. Um, all right, guys. Well, um, welcome to tonight's uh, Technocritical Assemblies with Dr. Ruth DeFries. Uh, she's a professor of sustainable development in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology at Columbia University. Um, so for us, it's such a treat as a group of architects um, to engage in dialogue and conversation with her um, and really understanding our roles on, um, with her expertise um, on planetary processes that's shaping um, true climate realities that we're working in today. Um, her work um, is very well known in the sense that it combines this deep knowledge of, um, of Earth um, Earth processes and, and knowledge with the precise use of technological tools and imagery um, while maintaining perpetually a critical understanding of human and non-human policies, politics, communities, um, entanglements across multiple skills, um, ecosystems, and spatial conditions. Um, so also um, using these satellite imageries and field surveys uh, in conjunction, we're able to um, she's able to, through her work, examine these critical issues like agriculture or um, human modifications of the planet, land use, food demand, you know, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really, you know, giving us that as a sort of situated context in which our work um, is sort of part of this large network of, um, of, of activity. She publishes widely in scientific and mainstream venues. She'll be discussing her book today with us, What Would Nature Do? A Guide for Our Uncertain Times. Um, and in addition to her many, many accolades, she is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, of the Park of Mello, the Board of Trustees, as a part of the Environmental environment, 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 Fund, Science of Nature, 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 Nature uh, the World Wildlife Fund, and, and um, she does a lot of work on conservation efforts in central India. Um, so tonight, I'll stop talking here. Um, we're so thankful for her time and expertise. Um, and we welcome um, Ruth to tonight's Technocritical Assemblies. OK. okay. Well, well, I'm going to okay. echo. Uh, you sound fine to me. Sound OK? Yeah. OK. That's strange. OK. Everybody here OK? So it's really fun to be with you and uh, and share with you some thoughts that I've been thinking about for quite a few years and uh, encapsulated in this book that I want to talk about. And particularly fun to talk to you who are so engaged with the design of the human world and think together about what we learn from nature about how to help us think about how we design our human world. So I am going to uh, hope this works. Get the chat up so I can see chatting. Okay, does that look okay? Uh, yes, we see your we see your slide. Uh, we see maybe your notes too. I don't know if that matters. Oh, you see the notes. Oh man, <laughs> that shouldn't happen. Hang on, I'm so sorry. Okay, I've done this 500 times and ever, and <laughs> I seem to mess it up. How about that time? How about that? Uh, now it's perfect. Okay, great. Let me get the chat box up. Okay. Good. So, um, so you know, it's not uh, doesn't take a lot of convincing after the year that we have had that we live in a very uncertain world. All kinds of shocks coming our way, and that it is also not surprising after the year we've had that uh, humanity is not particularly well equipped to uh, to foresee, to prepare for, or to deal very well with these shocks when they happen. So what I wanted to do was uh, think about how nature deals with, prepares itself for shocks and has been able to survive for billions of years through shocks. And what we learn from that, those strategies for our own human constructed world. So I wanna share those thoughts with you um, but just to just to uh, 
uh, emphasize the point about how uncertain and unpredictable our world is. This is just pretty astounding that in 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, there was this uh, rating of preparedness for global pandemics. The higher the value on the x-axis here, the more prepared, the lower the value, the less prepared. So who, which country is the most prepared according to this rating? The US. Which country is second most prepared? The UK. We all know what happened. So we don't do very well with foreseeing uh, how well we can deal with shocks. Somalia at the very bottom here has reported something like only 260 deaths. So uh, lots of shocks in store. So this pandemic was certainly a big one. The, uh, the irony is that I wrote this book over the last five or six years or so, and I was just sending it in to the publisher, final version, uh, when the pandemic hit last, uh, last March. So it was a bit of a scramble to put more in the book, but certainly proved the point that we live in uncertain times. Um, you know, every time I turn around, there's another example of the uncertain times that we live in. We have Texas uh, from the last couple of weeks and the climate extreme that happened there and the lack of preparedness and uh, inability to deal with that situation very well. Of course, that, uh, that resulted from a whole bunch of political uh, issues in addition to the climate extreme. So there's many other examples of the uncertainty that we live in, with, uh, fires in uh, North America and, and uh, Australia in fire prone places. We know we have uh, a future of climate extremes, hopefully not pandemics like we are going through now, but certainly there will be. Uh, emerging diseases in the future, all kinds of uncertainties, uh, political upheavals, and all of that becomes so much more intertwined and complex because of this incredibly interconnected world that we live with. And that is really this, this um, how quickly goods and ideas and um, information, food, moves around the world is certainly nothing new that, that there are interconnections and trade and movement of ideas, but the degree to which the world is interconnected is a very new experience for humanity. This is just if we think of the existence of our species over the last hundreds of thousands of years, this, the way we live as a urban species, most people living in cities, meaning they're relying on someplace else to provide the food and the water and dispose the waste. This interconnection is, uh, is new to humanity and creates a, <coughs> what, um, what complexity scientists call a complex adaptive system, which means that uh, basically unpredictable, all, all kinds of feedbacks and unintended consequences of any action we might so what I wanted to think about in this book was, was how, what, how nature has been able to persist over billions and billions of years with all kinds of shocks coming its way. Asteroids crashing into the earth, uh, extinctions, diseases, all kinds of um, uncertainties. And nature has persisted. It's not a foregone conclusion that life on earth would persist and it's certainly not intentional or by uh, design by some, <coughs> some super being, but uh, through evolution, these strategies have worked in nature because they work, because they allow nature to persist through uncertainties. So that's what I wanted to get at in the book and particularly think about how these strategies might apply to our human constructed world and how people are learning and incorporating their strategies in, um, in um, 
the economy and business and all kinds of different ways. So there are four strategies. So what I'm gonna do is just is quickly go through them and maximize the time that we have for discussion. And some of them might be more or less applicable to what you all do, which is so amazing, you design the world. So the first strategy in nature that has a lot of implications for us is about how, how nature constructs its networks. So human civilization is incredibly reliant on networks of trade and uh, movement of goods and movement of ideas and the internet and all kinds of networks that allow this urban world to, uh, to supply itself with food and water and, and so on. Uh, nature also is very dependent on networks from at all kinds of scales. So if you pick up a leaf vein next time you, you're outside, uh, pick up a leaf vein and you look at it carefully and you will see that there's a lot of uh, veins, a lot of very small, almost microscopic veins in a leaf. And that is a critical, like networks are critical to human civilization, that network in the, uh, the leaf is critical to the survival of the plant because water needs to move throughout the leaf and sugars need to come back from chlorophyll uh, photosynthesis that's going on in the leaf and back to the plant to supply uh, sugars um, for growth. So it's critical that this network functions. And it's also a cost to the leaf to build those, that network, those veins, because it has to supply materials and energy to construct those veins. So the problem with networks is they're fantastic unless something goes wrong. If there's a disruption at some part in the network like this, inside, this is a kale leaf from my garden. Uh, if an insect takes a bite out of the leaf, then the then the network, the movement gets disrupted. And, uh, and that's a real problem. So early in evolution of, of um, leaf veins, the strategy for the ginkgo tree, the oldest uh, tree, is that the, you see this kind of, under here where it says early, a kind of uh, not a loopy network. You see a very efficient network where there's, uh, there's a kind of a, a, a branching of networks, but not this kind of loopiness and redundancy in the network that evolved later on in, uh, in, um, in leaf veins. So what's the point? I mean, that's a, that's a cost that doesn't look very efficient to have all of those leaf veins and invest in that redundancy in the network. Uh, but physicists have done work on this topic and shown that what those, this loopy networks, redundancy in the networks is doing, it's, it's providing um, resilience when there is a disruption somewhere in the leaf. So there are not just an alternative to get from point A to point B, but multiple alternatives, many, many different ways to get from point A to point B. So if there is a tear or a bite taken out, then there is still some redundancy in uh, a different way to get around and to minimize the disruption. So interestingly enough, that is a concept that, uh, that humans have figured out over time. It was not always so. So this is Paul Barron, who is uh, one of the uh, famous people for his work that led to a functional internet. But when he was a young engineer at the RAND Corporation, his uh, task was to advise the Defense Department and the communications, AT&T, this was during the Cold War, on the communications network. So the problem was that there could be a an attack somewhere in the network. So how do you, design the, uh, the communications network to be resilient against attack. So the thinking at the time was this centralized strategy where there's a center hub, a communications central command. 
Uh, and what Paul Barron worked on was the idea that that creates vulnerabilities, kind of like the ginkgo tree uh, leaf uh, strategy, uh, where is if, if there's an attack on that central hub, the whole network goes down. So what he advised, he looked at this decentralized strategy, which is kind of a hub and spokes kind of strategy and a distributed strategy, which is a loopy network like Leafane's where there is no matter where there would be an attack or disruption in the network, there would always be, unless the whole thing come down, comes down, there would always be an alternative route to get from point A to point B. So he went and presented this to the uh, Defense Department and AT&T, and he was just laughed out of the room. This is just the, the, the uh, he called them the graybeards. The graybeards uh, just did not take him seriously. They said, this is a ridiculous idea that it costs because you have to invest in that, uh, that redundancy. Uh, it just didn't, they didn't see that it made any sense. But Paul Barron continued to work on this strategy and a decade or so later, the, uh, the founders of the internet, when they were developing the ideas about how to create the communication structure for the, um, the network structure for the internet, they came upon his work and realized that this distributed strategy like the leaf vein uh, is really what is needed to be able to have a functional internet. And that's what, uh, that's what came to be. So over time, people are realizing that some inefficiency, some redundancy is worth the cost. So in engineering now, this is quite an accepted, uh, quite an accepted concept, redundancy in engineering to have multiple engines on a jetliner. And I don't think any of us would feel quite safe getting on a big airliner now, unless there was some redundancy in the number of engines in case something happens to one, then there are others to hopefully uh, keep the plane flying. And that is a, a, a very accepted strategy. And even the idea of um, some, um, uh, design redundancy where engines are slightly different, designed slightly different or designed by different teams. So there, there is some insurance that there is some redundancy and they don't all fail at once. So, uh, so humanity is starting to, is, is learning this lesson about some investment in redundancy, even though it's inefficient and even though it's an extra cost is worth it when the risk is high. There are other parts of, of our human constructed world that we're, we haven't quite yet taken on that lesson about the value of redundancy in networks. And that is in our global food trade, which is actually going in the other direction, is becoming more concentrated so that more and more food is produced for the world in less and less places. And while that is efficient and makes food cheap and inexpensive and all of that is good, um, it also creates this vulnerability. And we've seen this vulnerability, if you remember back to the price spikes in 2008 and 2011, when there was some um, climate extremes that occurred, droughts that occurred in these high producing areas of the world. And then the repercussions just cascade and ricochet throughout the world. Uh, leading to real uh, escalating prices and real hardship and also feedbacks in the sense of being a complex system that then once the production goes down, uh, the political response is to restrict exports. So then that's just a, a, you know, a, a spiraling bad situation where food prices increase. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, with the droughts, which led to price spikes, which led to export restrictions, which raised prices. And then there are urban consumers, particularly the urban poor, who spend a huge proportion of their income on food, resulting in food um, riots. So this network, our global food trade network, is both 
good from the point of view of producing a lot of food and, and um, making food inexpensive by producing where it's efficient to produce, but also fragile. So how do we think about constructing our networks, all kinds of networks, whether they're communications networks or uh, global food trade or the internet or you know, all kinds of networks where, uh, where, there, where it's possible to build in some redundancy so that in the case of the um, global food trade, countries are not reliant on, uh, a, solely reliant on a, uh, a source that could be subject to uh, extremes and lead to problems like happened during these food riots. So that's one way of thinking about networks. Another way of thinking about networks is the other way. Um, networks can also be dangerous. I mean, we've seen the danger in uh, information networks when disinformation can spread rapidly uh, throughout a network. And we've certainly seen the danger of networks when we have a virus that uh, emerged um, in a town in China spreading around the world in just a matter of um, a matter of days. So networks can be great for making things flow, but there are, there are situations where you want to shut down a network when it's dangerous for materials, pathogens, information to flow across the network. So how do the social insects do this? They have this problem, like the ants and the termites who live millions and millions of individuals like cities uh, in colonies. So they have the problem that if a pathogen gets into a colony, it could, and it spreads, they would be devastated. Uh, they have ways to deal with this, like things that we wouldn't think about doing, like, um, like uh, hauling away the sick and things like that. But they also have some really clever uh, network strategies to minimize the spread of pathogens. And, and pandemics or epidemics don't happen all that often in beehives and termite colonies. And one of the reasons why not is because their social structure, their social network is, uh, is modular. So, uh, so the, they have specialized tasks and the ones that have the same task just keep, uh, have their own module, have their own part of their social network. So as soon as there is a pathogen that comes in to the colony, they can shut down the whole module. So they have to shut down a few links rather than everybody being connected to everybody else and, uh, and leading to spread of the pathogen. So this is uh, the kind of same idea as constructing our pods of family and friends and only, see, only communicating or interacting with them during the pandemic, same sort of idea of a modular structure uh, or cutting down uh, or um, uh, banning travel between countries, same, same idea of cutting, cut, trying to find those, uh, those links to cut that would stop the transmission. Uh, but, uh, but the social insects are much better at it than, than we are. So, the thinking here about networks is how to think about the structure of networks, a modular structure or loopy structure or small world structure, different kinds of structures of networks that are uh, appropriate for the benefits of networks, which is to keep the things flowing that you wanna flow and also able to shut down when there is danger uh, from networks. So keeping the benefits and minimizing the downsides. So nature has figured out some ways to uh, construct or have the architecture of networks that, uh, that can persist through uncertainty. So that's one strategy. There are four strategies, so I'll go <laughs> through them quickly. A second strategy is what everybody knows and loves about nature is that nature is so diverse. We have millions and millions of species. We don't even know how many. Uh, but we know that there is a lot of diversity on this planet, diversity of 
of life forms and uh, genetic diversity and all kinds of different diversity. And it also is pretty clear that we don't really need all that diversity to survive. We could do without it for our function. Some species are really incredibly important like pollinators and microbes in the soil that decompose waste. But we, um, but we could probably get away without all of this diversity. So what's the value of this diversity? The value is that uh, this diversity keeps options alive. It keeps like a library of options. So if one species goes extinct from a disease or some predator or some cause, then there are other uh, species there to take its place. So this diversity has served nature well for billions of years so that when, for example, the asteroids uh, crashed into the earth and created, uh, blocked out the sunlight, then other life forms could, um, could become more prominent like mammals after the dinosaurs. So this diversity is a key feature for nature's ability to persist through uncertainties. And it, in many ways, humans have taken that lesson on board, certainly in the world of finance where everybody knows that a smart investor will uh, diversify his or her portfolio and not only diversify the, uh, the investments, but diversify the types of investments. So this was the Nobel Prize winning idea about a mixed portfolio so that you don't want a portfolio where you might have a diversity of say different railway securities, but they'd all be subject to the same shock if something occurred. So to invest across different types of, um, types of investments that would be subject to different types of shocks. So that's the idea of diversified bed hedging, very well accepted and also uh, in the natural world. This diversity is, uh, is uh, important for example, these lizards in Hurricane Maria. So remember back in Hurricane Maria in the Caribbean a couple of years ago and the lizards, there are some really fascinating studies that have been done about which lizards survived the hurricane because it was really, really a big hurricane. A lot did not survive. So what was the difference between the ones that survived and the ones that didn't survive? The ones that survived had stickier toe pads so they could hang on better and they had thinner thighs so they didn't, their thighs didn't billow as much in the wind so they were less likely to get blown away and they were more able to hang on. So that diversity within lizards, that diversity of characteristics within lizards it was, is uh, critical to the ability to survive through uncertainties like hurricanes. If there's not, a, not an extreme event, it doesn't matter. But when a, a extreme event occurs like Hurricane Maria, then that diversity really, um, really pays off. Again, in our global food system, I do a lot on food systems, so that's why I have all these examples of food systems. Uh, we're going in the opposite direction, that our, uh, the diet for humanity is becoming more and more uh, homogenized and more and more reliant on a small number of globalized crops. So just a handful of crops, a handful of species, wheat, rice, maize, a couple others, provide most of the calories in the human diet. So we are um, uh, we're putting our, I think, <laughs> putting ourselves at some vulnerability by not paying more attention to the diversity in the foods that we grow, the foods that people know how to cook, the foods that farmers know how to, um, uh, how to farm, uh, different land races that are adapted to different kinds of conditions. We're coming, we're, we're going in the opposite direction of what we learned from lizards and what we learned from uh, diversified bet hedging. So in some cases we're learning the lessons from nature and or, or 
realizing that that strategy is beneficial and in some case would go in the opposite direction. So third strategy is that nature is full of these just incredible examples about the ability to self-correct. And that is that these self-correcting mechanisms are embedded in many aspects of nature from global scale cycling of carbon in and out of, of the atmosphere to, uh, to all the way down to cells and physiology. So in the carbon cycling, I won't drag you into the details of the carbon cycle, but the main point is that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over geologic timescales is, uh, is dependent on temperature because that determines how much rain uh, dissolves in rainfall and takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. So when it's hot, there's a lot of evaporation, it rains a lot, and there's a lot of CO2 that's pulled out of the atmosphere, so then it cools off because there's less greenhouse gases. When it's cool the other way, there's less rain, so there's more greenhouse gases that build up from volcanoes in the atmosphere and it warms up. So this is over geologic time scales. And when you look at the long-term record of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, you see this, this, just, this homeostasis just within bounds, uh, sort of cycling, not uh, um, staying within these bounds. Unlike our neighboring planets, Venus, who has a runaway, had a runaway greenhouse effect and Mars that has all its carbon blocked up and it's too cold. So this, this self-regulating uh, mechanism is really the reason why we're all here. Otherwise life would not have been able to uh, uh, persist for so long. So we see these kinds of self-correcting features in predator-prey dynamics. Everybody learns that in, in uh, biology and in, in physiology, like the way our bodies regulate the amount of um, blood sugar through insulin, through different hormones that are released when blood sugar is too high and other hormones that are released when blood sugar is too low. So we have uh, within bounds um, to stay within a, a safe zone. So nature is full of these examples of self-correcting features. And again, the finance world has really taken this lesson, not, not, you know, not necessarily, <laughs> Uh, from nature directly, but realizing that this strategy is one that is really important to have stability when uncertain events happen. So we all know, now we all know, because a year ago we were all hearing about the circuit breakers in the stock market that got tripped when the, uh, when the uh, stock market started to plunge. So amazing how, uh, anyway, that's a whole other story about what's, what happened with the stock market during the pandemic. But, but it did at the beginning start to plunge and trip these circuit breakers. So what a circuit breaker is, is a, um, when there's too rapid of a fall in the, in the stock market, automatically there's a shutdown and a halt, a pause for the market to stabilize and correct itself. So this mechanism of circuit breakers in the stock market um, came into being not that long ago in the Black Monday, the crash of 1987. And you can see an example here when there would have, it was called the flash crash in uh, 2010, where if it had not been for that circuit breaker that got tripped with that, that uh, rapid decline, then there could have been a worse uh, outcome for the uh, financial market. So we all read about the circuit breakers that went off uh, last March and they kept getting revised and they get, kept getting tripped. But this is really the same idea as the global carbon cycling or predator prey dynamics that there is a self-regulating feature that automatically keeps within safe limits. Now in the stock market, in our human constructed world, we have to, we have to uh, build those self-correcting features. And we also have to maintain those self-correcting features when they exist in nature. So the fires that have been so, um, so devastating out West, 
uh, is an example of what happens when we ignore these self-regulating feedbacks that exist in nature and exist in, uh, in, in, uh, the, in this case, indigenous knowledge. So the uh, fires we have not been so extreme and damaging uh, until, until European ideas of, of how to suppress fires uh, came to uh, came to the American West, and that was uh, the Forest Service, who previously had this policy, and this comes from Europe, that all fires are bad; they should all be put out by 10 a.m. the next day. And Smokey Bear, Smokey the Bear, some of you may know Smokey the Bear; he's very adorable. Uh, brought that message and uh, and propagated the idea that all fires are bad. But in, in nature, the, there's a really beautiful self-regulating mechanism where when the fuel load builds up, then there's always lightning or some cause for a fire. Then there is a small fire which reduces the fuel load and then it builds up again. So there's this kind of homo, homeostasis, but with the fire suppression that Smokey the Bear tells us about, uh, the fuel load has built up over a century and we see the effect. Uh, today, combined with uh, climate change and drier conditions. So we have some more uncertainty in store. So we kind of uh, ignore these self-regulating feedbacks at our peril. Indigenous management of uh, forests and fires, uh, it was exactly that, having these small fires and then not having these large, big, devastating fires. So how do we think about building these kinds of self-regulating feedbacks into our human constructed world? We see it in the finance. Um, and how do we build that into other, um, other aspects of our, of our civilization? So last one, then we can have a uh, discussion is this idea about enabling decisions from the bottom up. So you probably heard a lot about the tragedy of the commons, the idea that if there's common property, uh, like common forests or co common fisheries, um, then, and people can use them, but don't own them, then that's going to result in disaster. Uh, the tragedy of the commons. That's the idea of Garrett Hardin from the late 60s. And that is certainly true. We see that with the atmosphere today, which is a common property, and it's certainly a um, uh, tragedy uh, uh, for all the stuff that gets dumped into the atmosphere. But Eleanor Ostrom, who was just this amazing person who won the Nobel Prize in economics, uh, amazing for many reasons for her work. And she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And she's not an economist. She was a political scientist, she passed away, sadly. Uh, but her work challenged this idea, challenged the idea that common resources are always going to get trashed. So she studied many, many different examples of where people self-organize to manage themselves decide on the rules and manage themselves how to uh, sustainably use the common property. So she documented these examples with all kinds of things, starting out with groundwater in Los Angeles, community policing, fisheries, uh, forestry, irrigation systems. She did not say that there is never a tragedy of the commons. What she did was she identified these conditions under which um, these decisions from the bottom up, self-organizing behavior can result in sustainable management of resources. And she has these eight design principles that lay out you know, having the ability to control your own resource and enforce and these different principles that make it possible for these decisions, collective decisions designed from the bottom up, self-organized, that can lead to very positive outcomes. And we see this, and, uh, and I think we see this more and more, that we have so many examples of 
top down, you know, central command uh, legislation and uh, and uh, dictating from some um, uh, faraway place about how management should take place, whether it's a forest or or um, whatever it is, uh, and how that, that kind of top down management isn't always the most effective because it's really not based on the the reality of people on the ground who are in the best position to know their surroundings. So in nature, I don't think you can find any example of this top-down kind of strategy that seems so attractive to, uh, to our species. Um, a queen ant, labeled the queen, that's a misnomer. A queen ant in the middle of a hive is not telling all the individuals where to go. She would not be able to do that. First of all, she wouldn't have that information and she wouldn't have the ability to know what it, how to direct every single individual. So what has evolved in nature is this many examples of self-organizing behavior. Like when you drop a crumb and ants first uh, scramble around, it looks very disorganized and chaotic. And then after just a little while, they're, they're marching in a straight line. It looks like there's an army. It looks like there's a queen or a general who's, who's telling each individual to line up, but they're not. They are self-organizing just based on the, their own perception of their local uh, situation. So they are following pheromones that are dropped by the ant in front of them, and they are dropping pheromones for the ant behind them and just following their local conditions, which results in this kind of self-organizing behavior. So there are many exa there are examples that Elnor Ostrom has identified and other has identified where this kind of bottom-up self-organized behavior is um, uh, works for human decisions. And if we think about our uh, international climate negotiations, which really have not are far from solving the problem of uh, climate change. There were decades and decades of a kind of top-down thinking, dividing up the pie, some central authority saying how much each country is able to emit. Uh, and then there was Paris, which was a completely different strategy. That was a more bottom-up strategy where there was not a pie to divide up. There was bottom-up countries came to the negotiations with their own commitments about what they thought based on their individual circumstances, they could commit to reducing their emissions of greenhouse gases. Now we all know that that's far from sufficient, even if they did, even if all countries met their commitments that they brought to Paris, it would still not be sufficient, but it's the only time out of decades of lots of international negotiations where countries actually agreed. So this approach of bottom-up decisions is, I think, something we learned from nature. We don't find top-down commands, central authorities uh, in nature. So that's my take on four uh, strategies or secrets, not really secrets, that, uh, that has served nature well and that perhaps there are some lessons in there uh, for us. And it is certainly the case that, um, that we should think hard about how we're going to construct our human world for the uncertainties in, uh, in political upheavals and climate extremes and pandemics and all kinds of ways that we can't even imagine uh, that we face uncertainty in the future because we're such a complex interconnected uh, system. So that I will thank you. I will stop sharing and look forward to any thoughts, particularly about whether you think that these sorts of ideas are uh, relevant for the kind of work you do, which is so important in, in designing, designing how we live. Do you guys have any questions to start? Yeah, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. Um, great, great content. Um, and I was, I was, I wasn't expecting number four. I have to be honest. <laughs> um, 
I kind of saw some of the one, two, and three. Uh, you know, once you said it, I was yeah, that makes sense. But bottom up, um, it makes sense in some in some elements. But I, I wonder how it applies in the sense of averting disaster um, in the grander scheme of things. Uh, I can see how like a bottom up approach would be closely tied with a redundant network of sorts, where you don't have a centralized power dividing up the, the system, if you will, or whatever we're dealing with at the moment. But if you could speak a little bit more about how, you know, bottom up is, is as, a, as a system in, yeah. in, in avoiding disaster. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think, I think um, the way to think about it is that not every in decision or investment that humanity needs to make should be bottom up because there's certainly some things that just don't make sense to be bottom up, like for instance, developing a vaccine. I mean, there's no way that could happen <laughs> in a bottom up sort of strategy. But, um, but then there are some aspects that might be more successful if it were bottom up. I, I don't know. I, I wanna think about what would happen if instead of this whole crazy thing about wearing masks became so politicized and people, you know, locally got together, had the right kind of information, had their own interest at stake um, and could develop their own rules of behavior. Would we have seen a different outcome? I don't know, maybe, maybe people don't like being told what to do. So I think that that's what our challenge is, is to identify um, identify what are the decisions and investments that humanity makes that need to be top down and what might be more successful with a, a bottom up strategy, like enabling a bottom up sort of strategy. And to me, that seems like, um, uh, like what leadership is, like being able to tell the difference. And when it makes sense to have bottom up self-organizing kind of behavior, that would lead to a, a potentially more successful outcome to allow that to happen. But when, then when it is required to have a top-down strategy like investing in vaccines or building roads, I guess, things like that, um, then, uh, then be able to, you know, be able to tell the difference. I said building roads, but maybe I don't mean that. I think maybe communities should have more of a say in what roads get built in their, in their communities. Um, and David, yeah, definitely the whole power dynamics in, in human civilization is a uh, confounding, confounding role here. But, you know, there are many examples that Eleanor Ostrom identified, some of them being very, you know, local, like how uh, self-contained communities, but some of them not, like uh, her first uh, her first example that she studied in the 50s was about groundwater in Los Angeles and how it was really uh, on its way to depletion and, uh, and the many different users of the groundwater, uh, the municipal and farmers and uh, many different institutions got together and figured out how they're going to collectively manage their groundwater because they all depended on it and they all depend on each other. So. In a way, Eleanor Ostrom's ideas seem a little quaint because she studied a lot of very self-contained like subsistence kinds of communities that um, are less and less prevalent in the world today. But she also studied community policing, for example, um, where it's not all uh, you know, uh, subsistence type situation. So I don't, to me, that's what leadership is, is tell, being able to tell the difference between when bottom-up could lead to uh, enabling some bottom-up self-organizing behavior could lead to top, possibly good outcomes. Thank you for that. Um, I was sort of, I, I really loved your, some of the, I know you, you were saying you work a lot with food and, um, um, and especially it, like some of the work with like satellite imagery. I just wonder what, from your experience, what role does technology um, and how has it evolved in understanding 
um, sort of these networks where relationships say, sure, like maybe potentially using like satellite imagery to understand land coverage or use, but, you know, especially since oftentimes technology seems like such a top down uh, tool, right? At oftentimes, you know, how, how does that sort of reconcile um, maybe more of the sort of um, the granularity and the intent of, of some of the uh, um, policies even that we're trying to pursue? Yeah. So it, it technology, meaning uh, like remote sensing technology, satellite imagery technology is, um, uh, it's becoming more and more public and available, but there's still an enormous barrier uh, for people to benefit from it, but there are a lot of potential, a lot of benefits uh, in the kind of food system arena around uh, precision agriculture, which at this point is, you know, it's expensive. So well-off farmers can do it. That means, that means having a, a sensor where, um, where you know exactly where your crops need fertilizer or exactly where to put water. So you're not just blasting it all over. So it's more, uh, it's more efficient. Uh, and that's a kind of technology that can really benefit um, lots of farmers around the world if, if it were available to them and more and more it is. So technology plays a huge role. Technology also, the other has created a lot of the problems that we have in the food system, the mechanization and, and uh, uh, you know, irrigating crops where groundwater is getting depleted and all those things that technology has enabled is, uh, is you know, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, technology is always a double-edged sword, but it's not the technology itself, it's how is it, uh, how is it used and who's making the decisions about how it's used and who gets to use it. I wonder if there's like sort of examples, um, you know, like in which um, almost like technology adjusts to the community needs, um, like, you know, like the, the, the feedback loop is going the other way. Um, or if like special, especially, I know um, I see some of your papers where you, you study a lot of fires, right, in the Amazon. Um, and, you know, especially with probably like indigenous communities, I wonder if there's sort of, um, you know, instead of a top-down approach from technology to, to community, there's examples in which um, communities sort of dig, sort of collaboratively create technologies that maybe could even, you know, um, move a different direction. Yeah. I mean, the, there are indigenous communities in the Amazon who really embrace technology and embrace uh, uh, satellite data and being able to use it for all kinds of things to see where there's, um, you know, being able to enforce their own, you know, their, their land. So there's some real advantages to, uh, to that. The, the, fire, the fire issue is really a lot about uh, health I and mean, what people are breathing. So all those emissions that, uh, that um, go into the air and then uh, people are breathing them. So this is an issue in Southeast Asia and a uh, huge issue in the haze in Southeast Asia problems. Probably some of you are um, familiar with that because uh, uh, every year, especially during a dry season, when there are fires in uh, in Indonesia, they blow throughout uh, Southeast Asia and big political transboundary problem uh, and a really big public health problem. And similarly in the uh, in the Amazon, so the ability to sort of track the fires and uh, and figure out how to who where they're coming from who, why they're happening and reducing them is certainly something that I think um, communities, benefit communities from the health point of view. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, like even the examples that you, um, like about, you know, the traveling, the, the health effect of fires, it's like, now there's like technology, we can sort of quantify, um, quantify how those movements, that those processes, happen and I guess um, there's probably I mean there you know because of the new sort of visualizing of data that there's new um, governmental like governing governing structures and or sort of um, in how to even start to approach those questions um, that's not 
by country or something. Yeah, so. yeah. So, but you know, it all. I've worked a lot on these issues and like trying, you know, figuring out how you can trace backwards and see where the fires are starting and all these sorts of things. But in the end, in the end, um, for real change to happen. I think the bottleneck is on the governance, the way we govern ourselves, the institutions that we create, how we use this technology. Uh, you know, we could have the best ability to observe everything and know all of these risks. We did. I'm um, infectious disease scientists have been warning about a pandemic like this for for a while, and uh, it's. It's not for their lack of identifying that this would eventually happen. It's the um, it's our the way we construct our institutions, which is uh, a kind of um, a lot around the assumption that uh, that uncertainties and shocks well might not happen, and if they do, we'll figure out a way to deal with them. Um, maybe since we're you know we're we're in one minute left, but uh, maybe we'll end with Emily's question. Um, Emily, do you wanna pose your question to Ruth? Sure, um, you, you may have actually just answered it, but uh, so you had mentioned COVID and that you had um, basically added or changed part of uh, your book before releasing it. And I was wondering what exactly had you added or changed um, uh, from the advent of COVID? Yeah, so it's funny that um, really it was it was just a real mind bender that, <laughs> that I was sending in, literally sending in uh, the uh, the final manuscript. And I had I had already had in the book the thing about the the story about the social insects and the modular network structure to stop the spread of pathogens. So that was already in there, uh, um, but how could I not? add the example of, of uh, coronavirus. Um, so I quickly just, I added some more examples. And I added something about the 1918 pandemic and I added of something more about the circuit breakers. Um, so it wasn't that I changed any ideas. It was just that I had to incorporate what was happening <laughs> into the examples. Otherwise it would have looked very, outdated. Um, okay, well, thank you, everyone, and especially to Ruth um, for joining tonight. Um, yeah, I would encourage everyone to uh, check out the book in case you haven't already. Um, and thank you so much, Ruth, for I mean, some of these examples are just incredible. I love the LA groundwater one. And um, even those certain diagrams that you've shown with food security is, um, is just something for all of us to chew on. So um, yeah, have a good night, okay, everyone. Thank you. So I hope the book is readable. The point, the, the idea was to take these, these concepts about complex systems and find narratives and, and make it accessible and uh, I don't know, somewhat fun to read, but you can be the, the judge of that. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Good night. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you.